think of, uh, think of the, the most perfect version of me, and here it is in front of you. <laughs> think of all the weaknesses have disappeared. Here it is in front of you. They are a very precious couple. And I do think it's the um, grace of God that has uh, brought them to this fellowship at this time. I, I really do have a very strong sense, and I guess it was part of the prophetic word too, that um, we're under John and Josie's leadership. This fellowship is going to flourish. And um, it's like God is just within his season, within his timing. He, there's going to be a new season coming. And I just feel quite excited for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to have played my part and, uh, and, and perhaps there'll be further uh, of that. But, but John and Josie are, are going to be, uh, going to lead this church into some amazing things. So I, I do encourage you to hang in there and uh, to give them all the support and love uh, that you, and the uh, prayerfulness that you have given Teresa and myself. Philip and Mandy are here this morning. Philip uh, has been uh, previously the pastor of Catalyst Church. He's been the uh, president of the Acts 2 Alliance, which is the uh, denomination that our, our church is um, part of. And it is just, um, I know when we first talked about this service and what would um, happen, there was thought of Tim O'Neill, who's the president of um, Acts of A2A coming up. And I don't know, I don't think he would have been permitted anyway. But um, both John and I both independently thought we would much prefer Philip to be the one here. So it is a great privilege to welcome Philip and if you would just give him a applause and hand for this wonderful man as he comes and cheers. on yes okay thank you um i think you really look like a man who's ready to retire i agree with you <laughs> Teresa. i'm sure you're not usually as flustered as you seem to be this morning Uh, I do bring greetings um, this morning from uh, Pastor Tim O'Neill, the president of A2A, and uh, he extends, first of all, his congratulations to you, uh, Jeff and Teresa, for 42 years of faithful service. <laughs> Absolutely worth an applause. And, of course, he brings greetings to you, John and Josie at the beginning of this next chapter in your journey. This is a great day. It's a historic day. And uh, I often uh, remind the groups that I get the opportunity to speak to that they should be a real, um, they should be aware of history. They should sense the moment that they're in. And for all of you who are here today, you are actually witnessing an incredibly historic moment. So I hope that you will uh, imbibe of it, take it in and uh, treasure it in your heart in the days to come because you'll be able to say, I was there. So I want to speak this morning to three groups of people actually. First of all, I want to speak to the church as a whole, everybody in the room. And then I want to uh, say something to the outgoing pastor and his wife and then something to the incoming pastor and his wife. I honestly believe I've got something specific to say to all of you. You know, one of the most profound statements that Jesus ever made, he made at Caesarea Philippi. And one of the reasons that this statement is so profound is because of where he made it. Caesarea Philippi is not the kind of place that you would expect Jesus to be at. Caesarea was in the day the backside of the earth. It was like taking your leaders to King's Cross to teach them something. Caesarea was a cesspot of Israel, a place known where every kind of evil known to man could take place and where the most depraved people hung out. Prostitution, 
all kinds of sexual perversions. Even child sacrifice took place there. Caesarea was in Samaria and it's one of the reasons that anyone that who came from Samaria was so hated by the Jews. So Jesus takes them very deliberately to this place, a place called the Gates of Hell, which still exists today. It's a deep cave that is beside a pool, the very pool where children were drowned as they were sacrificed to their gods. And the people of the day knew Caesarea to be a place of evil. The cave known as the Gates of Hell was considered to be the gateway through which the demons from hell would come up out of the earth and then do their worst on the earth. So Jesus is talking to his disciples there near the end of his ministry to encourage them about the future. And he asks them this famous question, who do you think I am? Remember that? Who do you say that I am? Well, he got a few different answers. Uh, some said he was John the Baptist, some said Jeremiah, some said Isaiah, some said one of the prophets. But Peter has this revelation, this incredible revelation. He says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, the anointed one. And Jesus responds and says, that's a revelation, Peter. That's a revelation. And then he says this, and it's in Matthew 16, 18. We know these uh, verse as well he says on this rock on this revelation that you have Peter on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it for 2000 years against all odds the church has prevailed against the gates of hell the church has been and still is today the most persecuted body on the planet there's no possible way that it could have survived other than by the strong protecting arm of King Jesus who is the Lord of the church. The local church is the key to God's redemptive plan on the earth. And vision family, this morning, remind yourself that you are playing a vital part in God's redemptive plan in the earth. Anyone excited about that? You should be. Everyone, and uh, sorry, everything that God wants to do on the earth, he wants to do through the local church. The local church is the hope of the world. I love the church. I'm in the company of others today who love the church. I trust that all of you love the church. Uh, Pastor Jeff and Teresa have loved this local church uh, for 42 years. And Pastor John and Josie love the local church as well. They've been serving in the pastorate for th uh, 34 years. Uh, so he's only a young buck. <laughs> so cut him a little bit of slack. He dyes his hair grey. You wouldn't believe that, would you? So why do we resist so aggressively uh, the things that God wants to do in the earth? As we come to this uh, great day of transition, and induction, the church is actually in revival around the world. I wonder if you realise that. There are some amazing things taking place around the world. For the first time, listen to this, uh, you can Google it, and Mr Google's always right, right? For the first time since the first century, the church is growing at a rate faster than the world's population. And it's bringing hope to the masses who are responding to the claims of Christ. We don't hear about that. The media doesn't report that in the West. It's not according to their doctrine. People of Vision family, there's nothing like the local church when the local church is doing well. And research tells us that one of the biggest threats to the church is the failure to embrace transition. Today, uh, this historic day, you are in transition. Now, a major part of my assignment this morning is to tell you why transition is so vital to the local church, so vital to your future. Transition can be defined like this, as a change from one state to another. And so today, really, it's all about change. I guess you've heard about the church meeting when somebody said the 
light bulb in the porch needs to be changed. And the response was, change? Change? Who said anything about change? And it might be a joke, but there's something in us that rises up and wants to push back against change. It seems to be a human nature. There's universal resistance to change, especially in churches. Yet it's true the only constant is change. So why do we resist so aggressively? You know, some people get all freaked out about change. Most people don't like change and it has never been any different. You know, Jesus wasn't crucified because he came preaching about the gospel of the kingdom. Now, people stopped following him because of the values and the challenges of the kingdom, but he wasn't crucified for that reason. He was crucified because he came preaching change. It deeply offended the religious leaders of the day. We must embrace change if we want to see the future that God has for us. It's in the heart of God for you and I to embrace change and the heart of this message really is about change. You know, you're in a season of change. You're well aware of that. And for it to be successful, you have to believe that it is in the heart of God to make changes so that you can experience something new, something refreshing as has been prophesied already this morning. We have to believe that God wants to do what he said he would do. We have to believe that. I wonder if you realise that the theology of, theology of change absolutely fills the pages of the Bible from beginning uh, in Genesis to the end in Revelation, it's change, 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 a message of change. It's everywhere. God is absolutely unwavering in his commitment to change things and make them new. It's something that we should celebrate, not resist. He understands that you have to change things for us to be able to experience the new. There's a verse in uh, the Old Testament in Daniel that I often reflect on, Daniel chapter 2. It says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. And I remember reading that years ago and thinking, well, what do you do with that wisdom and power, God? How do you channel that wisdom and power? Well, the rest of the verse gives the answer because it goes on to say, He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and he deposes kings. You see, God is in the business of change. I want to read some verses out of Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31. And uh, these verses are going to be impossible to read because I don't have my glasses. So if you would like to just uh, help me with that, Mandy, they should be in the front there, easy to find. Thank you very much. So you see, this is what you can expect in retirement. <laughs> You'll be familiar with these verses. At, uh, the time is coming, declares the Lord. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. You know, that ushered in the greatest concept of change that the people of God had ever known. The God of the Old Testament is deeply into changing things and he prophesies about the changes that he has in his intentions for them. The God of the New Covenant is the same. In Matthew 18.3, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, 
unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that kind of sums up the whole story of the new covenant. You have to experience change to experience a new creation. Jesus and his disciples regularly offended the religious leaders because he was confronting traditions and making things new. The temple and its ordinances were all on the way out and eventually they were gone. And today we don't see them. They'll never be renewed. An interesting account in Mark 3 verses 1 through 7 gives us an insight into how passionate Jesus was about making things new. Jesus becomes angry at the religious leaders who are paying attention to some of their religious tradition. He calls them stubborn. You stubborn people, he says. You know, stubborn is actually a very polite transli translation from the Greek. A more accurate translation is stupid. We sort of can't imagine Jesus saying that. But when he spoke those words on that day, that's what they heard. Jesus said, you're stupid for hanging on to these old traditions. Stupid people. I made a list of some of the things that God changes and makes new, just in case you're not convinced that this is right through the pages of the Bible. This isn't even an exhaustive list, but it goes like this. A new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, new commandments, new garments, a new man, a new creation. Don't you love that one? A new creation. God makes you and me brand new if we're willing to change. We become brand new creations. But there's even more. A new covenant, a new name, a new heart, a new spirit, new wine, new fruit, new tongues, a new song. And then just in case you're not convinced in Revelation 21, right at the end of the Bible, Jesus says, I'm making everything new. So suck it up and embrace it. Be absolutely certain, Christian family, when you think new, when you think change, when you think transition, when you experience these things, God is in it. This transition has to take place because it's in God's nature to change things so that it can make things new, so that times of refreshing can come. Now, everything I've said so far was for everyone. Now I want to speak to Pastor Jeff and Teresa and Pastor John and Josie. But the rest of you can stay. You don't need to leave. You can listen and you can remind them of what I've said from time to time. You know, there's many illustrations in the Bible of transitions and I want to draw your attention to one that I think uh, gives us a vivid understanding of uh, exactly what is taking place today and it comes from Second Kings. Well, now and again, but it's one of those um, sections of Scripture that I think we often read through without really contemplating the meaning properly. So let me read 2 Kings 2, 7 through 15. This is when Elijah is passing the mantle of leadership to Elisha. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elijah had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak rolled it up and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left and the two of them crossed over on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elisha said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. 
and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, I was reading that last night and I suddenly had this image of Pastor Jeff walking out of the building after this service and <laughs> and disappearing, never to be seen again. And I said, Lord, please don't do that. <laughs> Teresa would be very sad. And so would we. <coughs> Hope I haven't spoilt this reading. Elisha saw this. He saw Elijah disappear. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father. The chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked, when he struck the water? And it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elijah. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. You know, that's an amazing account of transition and change that was taking place. Very often a service like this is called the passing of the baton service. I'm sure you've heard that uh, explanation, that term before. But, you know, in my opinion, the, symbolize, the symbolism of the passing of the baton doesn't really reflect what Scripture is saying in this passage. In fact, far from it. In fact, I would say that the symbolism of the passing of the baton gives a wrong perspective of how God intends transition to take place. Something very simple yet very profound is taking place here when, tran when, when Elijah transitions his leadership to Elijah. And let me explain it. You know, at most uh, transition or induction services, the implication is, is that leadership is passed from one leader to the other. And that's the kind of um, projection that is presented. But if you look at these scriptures, you will quickly see that the mantle of leadership was not passed from Elijah to Elisha. When the time came for Elijah's ministry to end, his mantle fell from him and it ended up on the ground. It wasn't passed on. Elijah left it there. He didn't attempt to pick it up because he had no further use for it. He was leaving the ministry he had and moved on with God to something completely new. So Pastor Jeff really listened to this. You no longer need the anointing you had as a leader here at Vision Family because you're moving on to a completely new season that God has for you and your wife. And Pastor John, you listen to this. Elisha had to pick up the mantle of leadership and when he picked it up, he did something with it. Pastor John, you have to pick it up and do something with it. These are very significant things in the change of leadership. And it was at the moment that Elisha picked up the mantle and did something with it that Elisha's leadership was recognized by the company of the prophets. Remember, they were watching when he picked it up and did something with it, they received him and submitted to him. This congregation will be watching you. And I say that uh, you know, with some humour, but also quite seriously, and you have a right to watch, but not to watch with a critical uh tone or with a expectation that uh, things will just happen as they've always happened 
You have a right, though, to be watching just to see the anointing that comes with leadership begin to function and operate through this couple. There's much more that I could say about this, but let me summarise what I've been saying as I bring this part of our service to an end. First of all, transition is a change from one season to another. And a reminder, Vision family, you are transitioning today from Pastor Jeff and Teresa to Pastor John and Josie. The church is changing from one season into a brand new season in its history. It's entering a new era in its life and purpose and this is the will of God for you as is demonstrated in scripture. And secondly, transition is vital because God always wants to change things and make them new. You know, that was a simple kind of prophecy that was brought earlier and yet it so uh, draws the picture of what you should expect in the future. God does want to do something new. doesn't mean that the old was bad or wasn't complete or wasn't good enough or anything like that. It simply means God wants to do something new, something fresh. The church is not an organisation. It's an organism. And an organism is a living, vital thing. It's always changing. You know, when I transitioned the leadership of Catalyst Church in Ithridge to my son Carl, I gave it a future. I future-proofed the church. And I think, Pastor Jeff, Teresa, this is one of the greatest things that you are doing today. You are future-proofing Vision Family. Future-proofing it. So many churches die and disappear off the scene when a long-serving pastor has gone. But uh, Pastor Jeff has done this prayerfully, thoughtfully, diligently, paying due attention to everything with the help of this eldership. And so today, you're in a place where God wants you to be. When I future-proofed the church, things changed. Under Carl's leadership, Catalyst has changed. But it's been renewed in its purpose. I future-proofed the church. And Pastor Jeff has been released today from the responsibility of leading this church. Today the mantle is being picked up by Pastor John. You know, I've officiated at a number of inductions uh, services in recent years and I have enormous respect for a leader who does not pick up the mantle again regardless of how tempted he or she may be. I know what I'm talking about. I watched my successor very closely and I've lied in bed at nights on some occasions thinking, what on earth is he doing? But I have not picked up the mantle. And that's what I say to you again. Do not pick up the mantle in those sleepless nights when you wonder, what on earth is he doing? Jeff and Teresa, you've been obedient to the voice of God. And the mantle of leadership of this church is falling off you today. It's not being taken from you. It's falling off you because you don't need it any longer. Do not pick it up again. You'll be tempted to. You know, well-meaning people, some of you will say things like, oh, it was good when you were here. And they may even encourage you to say something to the new pastor. Straighten him out or something. You know what? That might sound nice and you might feel like you're um, encouraging uh, this great couple, but in actual fact, it spoils this new season that they're in. You know, I felt so much uh, subtle pressure from people to pick up the mantle again, but by the grace of God, I didn't. You know, if I could go back uh, to the time of my transition and give Catalyst community some advice, uh, I, I would simply say, let us go. Let us go. And you know, the kindest thing that you can possibly do 
for your outgoing pastor and his wife today is to let them go. Let them go to a different kind of ministry. Let them go to whatever it is that they desire to do in these years of their lives. That's the best way that you can bless them today. When the mantle fell from Elijah, the Hebrew uh, word that was used is the word norfol, norfol. It has many meanings which mean much more than accidentally falling. You know, I've been kind of around this, but just let me reinforce it a little. You know, the concept of the mantle falling is that something accidental took place and, you know, Elijah didn't grab onto it quick enough or something like that. No, um, it's something quite different it means that it was God's intent for it to fall. It means it was allowed to fall to the ground because he no longer needed it. So I say again as I come right to the end, Jeff, leave it there. John, pick it up. When you pick up the mantle, use it for God's glory. Now that's when the church will receive you as its new leader. You'll be received when you serve God and them in the anointing of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. So what a wonderful day this is. It really is a day of joy and gladness as you walk together into the purposes of God. All four of you. I love the scripture in Isaiah 43, 18, 19. Often repeated, often um, declared in all sorts of uh, situations, especially situations like this. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? You know, you can miss the thing that God is doing if you try and hang on to the past. And that goes for this congregation, it goes for Jeff and Teresa, and it even goes for John and Josie. It's a new day with new opportunities and God is in the midst of it. So we come to uh, the opportunity now to just uh, pray for, first of all, Pastor Jeff and Teresa, and then we're going to pray for Pastor John and Josie. And in this, uh, in these moments, church, can I really encourage you to engage and to really open your hearts and allow God to do something not only in these guys but in your hearts as well, because this is a spiritual moment. This is a moment when God wants to visit with us, visit with your spirit and their spirits and do something very significant so that the church here at uh, Vision can go forward into its future. So I would invite you to come and join me here on the platform. Is this the right place? Can everybody see if you step up here? That's great. That's fantastic. You know, technically we're not supposed to lay our hands on you. It's a difficult thing in a circumstance like this. So um, I'm going to pray and mostly I'll just uh, extend my hand towards you, but I insist on breaking the rules for just a moment, okay? Just a little moment. And uh, God will do what God will do. So let me pray for you. And, and church, I just extend your hands towards uh, this great couple you know, 42 years is significant. Um, I think the number 40 means time of testing, proving. Obviously, you needed two more years. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Uh, what it tells me is uh, longevity. What it tells me is faithfulness. What it tells me is uh, championship. And, uh, you know, last night I was just sitting and praying and I, I thought, Lord, can't you give me something a bit stronger than that? But I had this word, champions, champions. It just kept coming to me. 
And can I say uh, that's significant because we're living in an age when people quit, people give up, people don't run the course, but you haven't. You've kept running. You got to the finish line. You did what God called you to do. And that's magnificent. That's champions. Champions. So, Father, I do pray this morning in the power of your spirit that you would visit with uh, Jeff and Teresa, that you'd visit their spirits right in this moment and they would sense your pleasure on their lives. Lord God, just bring to their, to remembrance the experiences that they have had here in this fellowship. The moments when men and women have come to faith, men and women have been healed, men and women have been set free from uh, demon activity. Times when there's been breakthrough in men and women's lives. Lord, bring these things to remembrance and let them know that they had a part in it, that you trusted them with this ministry in this season and that you used them to bring these things to pass. Oh God, just rest on them heavily now, I pray, with your sense of pleasure and let them go from this building in a short while rejoicing, joyful, happy in the knowledge that they have done the things that you have called them to do. And Father, I just pray that in the days ahead uh, you would speak to their hearts and give them clear understanding of what they should be doing. Lord, let this not be a time of heaviness but a time uh, of great joy as they work out the things that they can do with more time available, with less pressure. Lord, let this be the most exciting season of their life. Bless them in every way possible, I pray in Jesus' name. And now in this moment, O oh God, we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit that you are releasing them from this ministry and so symbolically we release them now so that they can walk into their future knowing that your hand is on them never to leave them and we thank you in Jesus name Amen 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 God bless you both champions you really let that word settle in your spirit uh, that's why you should feel the pleasure of God. You know, we stand and hail King Wally because he's a champion football. The whole crowds do. But there, there are crowds of people who would see you as champions today. So you stay right here because you need to be a part of what's about to take place. Pastor John and Josie, would you please step up to the platform? Make a little bit of room here. Okay. What, what do you want? Oh, I don't understand. You just do what's got to be done. <laughs> okay. Do I move here? Do I? Okay. All right. Well, this, uh, this is an incredibly significant moment for you guys. Uh, you came to ca uh, Catalyst, and I think it was probably probably in everybody's minds that this is where we, you would see at your ministry season not to be. God had other plans. And uh, you were certainly our loss at Catalyst, but you are the gain uh, to this uh, great fellowship. And uh, I just believe that uh, as you step into this season that uh, it's going to be everything that you in your heart desire it to be. Again, I was just looking for something that I felt came from the Lord to share with you last night. A and I just uh, felt that God was saying, um, this will be what you want it to be. In other words, you've got to make it happen a bit, I guess. Uh, I don't want to try and interpret that, but this will be what you want it to be. That's what I believe God said to me. 
So I just want to uh, ask you a question, John. Um, something uh, that you need to declare before the congregation. It's a simple question I'm going to ask you and you will answer accordingly. Pastor John, do you promise before God and this congregation to be true to your calling, to exercise the gift of your calling, to lead this congregation with integrity, without thought of personal honour or personal gain, and honour God in all the functions of your ministry, recognising it is not in your own strength, but in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it says in um, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7, and this is Paul speaking, he says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. That's how it happens. So let's pray. And again, just uh, reach your hands out towards these guys and we pray. Father God, as we stand in your presence in this moment, we recognize that this is an incredibly significant moment for John and Josie. Lord, you have brought them this far for this purpose. You have brought them through the experiences of the past for this purpose. And you have equipped them for this purpose. And so today we just pray that the anointing of leadership to lead as a pastor will rest on them. That they will sense that overwhelming presence of your Holy Spirit in power as they take up this mantle of leadership. Lord, give John and Josie together as a team the courage to pick it up and do something with it. And Lord, let that something be something which is right in your purpose, right in the centre of your will. Lord, bless them, encourage them, build them up in the Holy Ghost, I pray so that these days be great days, momentous days, wonderful days, as they step out in faith to take on this responsibility. So, Father, I just pray that you would bless them and keep them, keep them in good health, keep them true to your word, and let them honour you in everything they do in this place mm. for your glory's sake. Mm. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Why don't you welcome your pastor? <laughs> this is your opportunity to speak. Have you got a mic? Do you There we go. <clears throat> so I understand I'm closing the service. Pastor Jeff, is that right? Anything else? Anything I need to remember? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Pastor Philip and Mandy and Pastor Jeff and Teresa. Much appreciate all that's taken place today. And I just want to share just a couple of thoughts as uh, we close this morning. Probably only a half an hour or so. It's, it's so I just um, want to, on behalf of Josie and myself, just just thank you all for just welcoming us, welcoming, welcoming us so warmly today. And I feel, I really do feel that we are stepping into an already strong flowing stream of God's purpose here at Vision Family Church, Vision Christian Family. We're not. We're not initiating, even notwithstanding everything past Phil said, we're not, we're not initiating some brand new thing. We're stepping into a stream that's already flowing very strongly. And Philippians 1.6 came to mind for me 
being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And clearly there's an, an individual and a personal application of that scripture, but I think we do well to remember that that scripture was not written to a person. That was written to a church. That was written to the church at Philippi, not to any particular individual. And um, so in this new thing for us, I see uh, application for the church here, uh, what God has begun long before, that which Jeff and Teresa and all of you have faithfully stewarded over a long period of time. He will carry it on to completion, whatever that looks like, whatever that means in the sense of God's purposes, he will carry it on to completion in the day of, of Jesus Christ. And Josie and I simply have the privilege now of being part of the ongoing story. Part of the ongoing story. And one more scripture that impressed on me for today was Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. And every season has its fresh challenges. But the mercy and grace of God is there for us as we seek him for it. And I am totally confident that together, all of us together, will, as we do exactly that, that God will do what he says he does. That is, he will prove himself faithful in doing what he wants to do at Vision Christian Family. Absolutely believe that. That's all I want to say this morning. I'd just like to close our time in prayer. Can we all stand together as we, as we close? Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, what you will do in the life of this church. Lord, I thank you for all that has gone before. Lord, Pastor Jeff and Teresa, but not only them, everyone who has contributed to the life of this church in times past, who are continuing now to put their shoulders to the wheel, to put their strength to what you're doing and for what is going to happen in the future. Lord, much of that is unknown. As we've seen this year, we can't always predict what the future will bring. But Lord, one thing we know is that you never leave us or forsake us. You never abandon us, but you're there with us. And we are confident as we go forward from this day that that will be true, that will be so because of who you are. And so, Lord, we just pray that as we go from this place today, we go with your blessing upon us all. We go with the, the gospel upon our hearts, with your spirit upon our lives in every way. And, Lord, we will continue to be the church as we leave this building in our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools, wherever we find ourselves, we will be the church of Jesus Christ in this week. And for your glory, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day and week. Amen.